Good evening, good morning, good afternoon. Good day, everybody. We've only got one in tonight, Rob, so he's getting private lessons, which is pretty good. <laughs> As usual, we've got our earworms in the back. Oh, well, they'll be in the forefront here because I can't isolate them out. But we're going to have Sid and Jay. And uh, we'll be a little bit different tonight. They'll actually run through the chat as to who's in. This is going to be fairly quick. I'll be lucky if it makes an hour, actually. So if you've got a heap of questions, just ask. And right at the start, um, probably this will be the last live lesson unless somebody requests something in particular for the simple reason that we go into daylight savings tonight after this. So we move forward an hour which puts us an hour further ahead of you. And then at the end of this month, the English people will go back an hour, which puts us two hours. So I would be appearing at 10 o'clock at night rather than uh, your, which would be one o'clock your time. So that's, that's the story at the moment anyway. But if anybody has any requests for anything they want to learn, Feel free to message me or email me and we'll work out a time and do it, okay? All right. I'm going to enlarge the screen so I won't see the chat. Go for it, Sid or Jay. Read out who's on, who's not. <laughs> I'm getting the point to me. <laughs> so we've got the mm. Philip Clements is in first, Ricky's Rocket, Lawrence, Bagasia, uh, Donald M. Uh, wooden things are you a little dodgy one that one. Oh yeah definitely Tom, Tom, Tommy's workshop Clive Rogerson occasionally turning with Terry uh, and that's it for <laughs> now oh, no, William Rose creates is in and Steve Ash right okay well tonight is finishing the products, in other words, sanding, the most boring part of all. Now, every good finish starts with sharp tools. You cannot get away from that fact. If you've got blunt tools, you're wasting your time. Now, we're going to start on finishing spindles first. I know I've touched on it before, but we'll do it again. Now, normally we get a finish off the chisel that is actually glazed off our skews. And we actually have to sand to break the, the burnishing on the, on the work so that stains or finishes will stick to them. So fortunately in commercial work... Robbo. Yeah. Can I mention something, please? Yeah. Um, maybe you should highlight yourself as, and have us in the smaller screens like I do. Uh, I'll just put myself right up there and put you right into the background. Yeah. Okay, good idea, Joe. Like so. Rightio. Now, commercial work, we're lucky. We finish about 180 in most cases. Um, we don't sand above that because we just send the stuff off and the people finishing it. Now, there's virtually three or four levels of finishing. If you're doing stuff for yourself, Sometimes just off the chisel, unless it's a piece of furniture or something like that. But if it's a utility item, just straight off the chisel will generally do, or a bit of a lick over with a 120 paper. Then there's the, the craft market type thing, where you go to oh, 240, 320 with um, a new Yorkshire grit or uh, triple E or axe paste or whatever abrasive paste. Now, I will not be using any abrasive paste tonight. There's that many videos out on using that, that it's, everybody should know how to use it anyway. So Terry Bartlow and Axel have just dropped in, Robert. G'day, Terry. So, um, lost me trying to thought. Oh, yeah, the craft market type of things. Now, craft markets, I've found that people are they got exceptionally long pockets. I think they're down near their ankles somewhere. They're looking for the cheapest price they can get stuff at, so why spend hours finishing something off? And then there's the art-type markets where it's strictly handmade, hand-grown or hand-what. So that's another step up again. So you generally go up to about 400 or so on that. 
And then above that is gallery work. Now, gallery work, I've got a friend that does pieces for nothing but galleries and art exhibitions. He will spend 20 or 30 hours sanding and get right down to virtually flower paper. Now, for those of you that don't know what flower paper is, flower paper is actually less gritty than a piece of A4 printing paper. So that's the grit that he goes down to. And he'll just sit in front of the TV, just sanding each piece and each piece until it glows in the dark. Now, with your finishes, there's two types of finishes as well. There's penetrating finishes like oils and uh, stains. And then there's surface finishes, which are your paints and your lacquers and things like that. They just sit on the surface, polyurethanes. So you've got to sort of work out right from the cut if you're doing it for a customer, which we do, you've got to work out whether they're painting it, staining it, or whatever. Now, veranda posts, naturally, they get painted, so we only sand them down to, to 120 at the most. In fact, mostly we stop at 80 grit on those because the painters just like it because the paint sticks to them better anyway. Furniture legs, we used to go down to 180, and that was about the max. Um, some of the stuff we did for some of our art, arty farty customers, we used to go down to 400 on them. And then they had the problem of finishing it after that, but most of them were oiled, so the oil will penetrate even a 400 coat. The important thing to remember is that hand-turned items have got generally sharp edges. Now, most paint or lacquer does not like sticking to a dead sharp edge. So... We just do take them off a little bit, generally with the last coat, last piece of paper. Now, sanding something like this, we've gone through the rounds. I generally start at about 180 if it's uh, a furniture piece. Now, the paper that we use is J-Flex, it's called. It's a cloth-backed paper, and in our... In our situation, production work, there is only three types of three brands of paper that we use. We only use Hermes, which is what this is, SIA, S I A, or Klingspore. If you watch Steve Jones, he uses Klingspore. Now the reason we use that is because when you fold it like that, the, the abrasive doesn't snap doesn't snap off at the joint. So you've got a nice sharp edge. And we always fold it in half or use a whole sheet like Steve Jones does so that it doesn't slip in our fingers. The way we hold it is two fingers underneath like that and a thumb on top like that. So that if it does grab, it just flicks out the back. Now, to do a cove like this or up into this corner here, you can actually roll the paper up like so and get down into there. Now... With these types of things, we always work from the bottom up to the edge so that you don't dub that edge over. We don't come in over the top and then do it. So the method of – it's the exact opposite of turning them, actually. We come from the bottom up to the top on those, whereas in turning, you always work downhill. Sanding, we tend to work uphill. On long sweeps like this, we do them parallel to the work. So – just uncurl this again. Always go up and down the grain like so. Between yeah, each bit. Do you want to just go yep. through those brands of paper again, just in case anybody wanted to note them down? Yeah, Hermes, H-E-R-M-E-S. I think they're worldwide. I'll put them in the chat. SIA, S-I-A. Or clings poor. Now I know you've got abronets and all of those sorts of things. I've never, well, I have used abronet and that, but uh, I still come back to my Hermes. The other thing when you've got a piece of sandpaper is always get rid of any threads like that. I'm not sure if you can see it. Yeah, you can. Yep. See the thread there? Always take it off because that thread. 
will be just about pure abrasive and will leave massive scratches on something. Now, when you're sanding, the first, the first objective of sanding is to get rid of the tool marks. That's what the first sanding procedure should be, to get rid of any tool marks. Subsequent sanding is to get rid of the sanding grit from the grit before. So that's why it does not pay to jump from, say, 120 to 320 or 180 because you've missed out a grit in between somewhere. And sandpaper has worked out the way, this way. The other thing is, too, never mix your brands of sandpaper because the grit can be fractionally different on every brand. So what might be 80 or 120 on one, like I've got some here where the 120 is actually equivalent to 80 grit on another brand. There is actually charts on the internet that shows you the differences between the brands. So if you get one brand, just stick with it the whole way through. And the way you work out which grit you need next is that you take the one that you're using, which in this case is 180. Now, if I started with 120, you halve that which gives you 60, and then add it to the 120, which gives you 180. So that's the next grid up. To get to the next grid, you go 180, divide that in half, which is 90, add that onto the 180. The closest one to that is 240. So you go 80, 120, 180, 240, 320, 400. Okay. So Donald M's asked where you buy your sandpaper. I buy it direct from Hermes. Hermes are only 40 kilometres away from my place. And I buy it direct from the factory. But the average person can't buy it direct from the factory because we buy it. Wait on, I'll just go and get how we buy it. That's how we buy it. That's a 50 metre roll. We used to buy two of those at the beginning of every year in every grit. Over two and a half thousand dollars worth of over two and a half thousand dollars worth of sandpaper, and that'll last us for 12 months. So, but you can get the Hermes. Uh, um, I know. Sandpaper the, man sells Hermes. Yes, I know. Again. Yeah, he does. Um, I'm talking about Australia now. Most wood turning supply places like uh, Carol's, uh, Dave Drescher, um, uh, the Gap in New South Wales, and various other places, and I think Carbor Tech as well, all sell Hermes paper, but they normally sell it by the metre which is a three-inch wide strip like that and a metre long. Costs about 6 or $7, I think. Now it's gone up considerably in the last 18 months. Right, just got to have a slurp on the cup of tea here for a second. <clears throat> so if you're in Australia, the Sandpaper Man sells one metre, five metre and 25 metre rolls. Yep. Okay, so you got, you got thirty watt. You got thirty watching at the moment, Robbo. I oh, yeah. the the count's hidden on this because of one camera in front of it. Now, generally, when you're sanding, you slow the lathe down because sandpaper is meant to use by hand at that speed. So you can imagine the difference when you're. Uh, actually using a rotating item. Plus, with a lot of our Australian hardwoods, if you over sand, if you sand too much, you overheat them and crack them. You crack the timber from the heat. And if you're using softwoods like pine and that, if you sand for too long, you'll get high spots and low spots because you're taking the soft spot out of the hard grain. So 
always be aware of that. Now, as I said, start from the bottom. I keep the timber flat, the paper fairly flat. Put a little bit of a roll in it to come up this one. Up over the top of this. Right into the corner down here and up towards the centre. With a cove out here, up towards the edges. Fillets I generally don't worry too much about because they're a nice clean cut. And then up over the top of that, down into the fillet down here, onto that, then over the end of the leg and start from the fillet and work up towards the top. Now that's every grit. Now, that was 180. I'll go to 240 just for the purpose of the exercise here. What I do is switch the lathe off on a long thing like this. If you've got a table leg or a chair leg where you've got a long taper or a swell and a cove, always sand them by hand before I start sanding with the next grit. Now, I'm not going to sand this through all the grits, but I'll now sand this with 240. The last grit, if this was being lacquered, is about 320. And I, the last job that I would do is go down these tapers because on tapers you can actually see any scratches. So always go down the length of them and you'll end up with a much nicer job. As you can appreciate it, you can't get down into the coves and sand them stationary. Right. I'll just take this out. And I'll put in this when I knock. Now, where do I put my knockout bar now? Do 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 do. There it is. So Adam's dropped into the chat. Hi, Adam. He's got a small child in tow again. Oh yeah. I'll have a flat white, thanks, mate. He's watching from a cafe in Colchester. Ah, oh, this. Hope he's got a pencil and pad to take orders. Woodworm Paul's in. Good day, Woodwork Paul. Paul. Now, as I've said quite often, you should never tighten these chucks like that because I've seen these crack through. But... Because I've got something mounted in it already, I have to, unfortunately. Now, I haven't done the inside of this bowl. I've just done the outside of it. So, again, you just work through the grits. Like I say, sanding is pretty easy. I'll just straighten up this edge a bit first, I think. Safety glasses on. Neil's in. Jennifer's in. Good day, Jennifer. Now, quite often for a final cut, I'll use a spindle gouge rather than a bowl gouge because it has a slightly different cutting action than what a bowl gouge does for a couple of reasons. I'll just show you. And a lot of people say you should never use a spindle gouge on a bowl, but that's all they used to use at one time because that's all they had. So, again, you've got to keep, make sure you come up with the grain or you'll tear it. Now, the reason that they cut differently is this. It's the shape of the nose. If your spindle gouges have this fingernail grind on them, you've got a much better cutting action, slightly more cutting area than what you have on a bowl gouge, even though it's got a slightly round nose. So a spindle gouge does a better cut on that sort of thing. And you, I'll just show you the other difference too. If you've got a spindle gouge that's got a long nose like that, it is very, very hard to cut as well because all it wants to do, you've got no bevel support, 
behind the tip or not enough bevel support if you sharpen it in a detail grind type of thing. And you can get a very, very small cut with a spindle gouge. 45 degrees on the flute. So Rex has got a question in a minute, Robbo. Yep. You can see the size of the shavings coming off. So Rex's question, when sanding end grain, a three inch sized area was raised up, but the rest was smooth. What technique would you recommend? Right. Well, that's, that's the technique that I would recommend. Or I, I'm going to get myself into a lot of trouble with this statement, <laughs> but I think it's got to be said. I cannot understand why people take to a scraper after they've used a gouge because a gouge in 99% of cases cuts a lot better than a scraper does. Unless you're doing a shear scrape. Now I'll run over the shear scrape again on because people are still doing it wrong. I'll just get my other bowl gouge right on. So Neil said that seems to be going very slow, or is that just his video? No, no, I've actually got, I slowed the load down to sand the leg, Neil. Normally I'd have it up about there. Right, the things to remember with a shear scrape is that the handle must be low. I'll have to change cameras three times here, so... We've actually got four cameras set up tonight. The handle must be right down like this. I'll zoom it out a bit. Straighten the camera up a bit too so it's not drunk. I thought that was me. Drop it down a bit. The handle must be right down, like that, at least 45 degrees or lower. Change cameras again. The angle must be less than 90 degrees to the timber. That's 90 degrees to the timber. It should be around there like that. And this top flute here should be nearly shut. So you've got your handle right down low. Got the flute closed right down and less than 90 degrees to the timber. The reason for that is that when you do put it down like that, as I've said before, I actually prefer my spindle gouge for doing a shear scrape. With the flute at 45 degrees, and the handle horizontal. So it's like that, and you're cutting just off the, the tip there. And you can actually see what you're doing. You can go either direction and again end up with little bits of fluff. Now you can also use, and as I said last week, my shear scrapers are a lot different than most people's. I'll just turn the light off for a minute now. My negative rake scrapers are raked right back. like that. I do not run a burr on them. It is a sharp edge like a skew chisel. Now, if you hold it down flat and use it, which is the normal way you do the inside of a bowl, 
you're going to make it worse than what you started using the gouge. So the answer to that, move the rest back a little bit, keep the tool horizontal, but at a 45 degree angle. So if this is your timber here, you lift it up off the rest 45 degrees and you're just scraping, you're just cutting down here because an angle says cutting edge and it's the angle on the cutting edge, 45 degrees, that does the work. If you hold it down flat, it's just a scrape. So you're making it a planing cut, Robbo? Yeah. Less than 90 degrees to the wood. And again, you can move this backwards and forwards. And that's my preferred shape for, for scrapers. There's an elliptical thing like that. Now, as I said last week, if you've got tear out in a certain area, there is another way of doing it as well. Like this has no tear out at all in it now. But you can use a cabinet scraper like this. The Japanese use them quite a lot. And you can just, if it say there was tear out here, you just scrape it out like so and get rid of it. It is hard work to try and sand out, tear out. You're better off going and sharpening the chisel right up and the last two cuts that you ever make on something should be do with a dead sharp chisel. So the rest of it is just hacking material out of the way. Okay. Any more que any questions on that so far? No, Neil's this is the last question. Yep, no, all good. <clears throat> right. Just hold on a second. Right, now again sanding is the bane of a lot of people's lives. Everybody hates it. So the better the tool, the better you can, the finish you can get off the tool, the less sanding you have to do. So Rex has got a question that I could almost answer, I reckon, but his question is, what's your favourite beverage in the fridge in your shop? Milk. Because it Cup goes in cups of tea. <laughs> That's where I was going. Right, now there was power sanding, rotary sanding, um, and just plain sanding. Now a lot of people start at 80 grit. I generally start about 120. Sometimes I cheat and I actually go up even higher than that and start at 240. But I'll demonstrate both, both lots. So, okay. Rob, I read somewhere the other day on one of the wood turning pages, I reckon it was, you, when you're sanding, you do all your sanding with your first grit and then after that you're just taking the marks of your original grits out. Yeah, that's what I just said. You, your first sanding is to remove your tool marks because it doesn't matter how careful you are, you're always going to get just little lines or something in it. Like, I'm not sure if you can see this. I'll see if I'm going to zoom it in a bit and show you. Come on, focus up. No, it's not going to focus that one. Try this one. No, it's not going to go across. All right, I'll just go back a bit. Oh, come on, you mongrel. You can just see it there, Robbo. Yeah, you can see little ridges down here, right? So that's what you've got to get rid of. There's no tear out in it. It's just where the tools run across. Now, with exceptional careful handling of tools, 
you can really, really minimise that. But I never worry about that. As long as there's no tear out in it, the first grit will take them out. And then, as, as I said before, all you're doing after that is removing the sanding marks. Right. Now, power sanding. I use an angle head Makita angle grinder with a pad in it. Now, with these rot rotary type sanders, any of these that are, you use a pad, don't try and crush that right down to nothing. Remember what I said, the sandpaper was normally meant to be used by hand at hand speed. If you're putting too much pressure on, A, you're going to, in some cases, you'll actually burn the timber. And in most cases, you won't sand it properly because the sandpaper gets so glazed up that all it's doing is polishing the, the thing into it. So again, set the speed down. Now, I tend to work underneath. I'll just change cameras again. So get rid of this tool rest so you can see what's going on. I work down in here. And you'll notice, go back to the overhead camera again, that the top of the pad is completely clear of the work. Now, normally I'd have my big dust extractors on, but nobody would hear anything if I did. Now, the shaping is done with your chisel, not with the sandpaper. So you've got to get a good shape in there first. Now, uh, when you're removing these discs, I'll just get my rotary sander for a minute. What normally happens with these is that the Velcro comes away from the rubber. Like this one's about uh, 15, 20 years old, I suppose. A better way to get take them off, and that was done by an unknown person, not me, is sit your thumb in there, lift the pad up, and then put your finger on, on top of the pad and then take the sandpaper off so that you're not putting strain on the Velcro bit. And they should last for years. Now, I myself do not power sand much except on fence posts, uh, except on big posts and things. Then I use a four, four or an eight-inch angle grinder with a sanding disc on it for the simple reason it just takes too long with a two-inch or three-inch disc like this. So, or I use strips of sandpaper that are held like a shoe shine, held like a shoe shine cloth. So, hey Robbo. Yeah. It's every now and then it's it's a little bit jerky. It's um it's not all the time, but every now and then I don't know. Have you got your? Do you know if your uh, antivirus or anything's running in the background? I wouldn't have a clue to be quite honest. All right, yeah, just it's just just a bit rough sometimes. All right. Now I don't like power sanding much because. If you get it out into bright sunlight, you can actually see little scratches. I'll just get a pencil. You can actually see squirrel marks like this in it from the sandpaper. And if you're going for a gallery finish or something, you've got to get it out into bright sunlight or have an exceptionally bright light. What I normally do if I'm finishing something off a, a gallery or something like that, not that I do it very often, <coughs> but I have a few picky customers. I take the whole chuck off the lathe. I never take it out of the chuck. Take the whole chuck off, put it outside in the sun. We do have sun in Victoria occasionally. And rotate it around every which way. Or I'll just get another one, won't I? So you get this and you rotate it around this way and that way and look at it from various angles 
to see if there's any scratches in the finish. Now, if you have a scratch, if you have scratches at the grid of paper that hasn't removed the scratches before, you have to go back two grits and start again. It's as simple as that if you want a perfect finish on it. Right. Now, my preference for sanding bowls is actually a rotary sander like this. Now, I know that in England you can get the Simon Hope ones, the Sorby ones. I don't like the Sorby ones much. This is the Australian one, um, and it's just called a rotary sander. It's been around for about 30 years. It was uh, invented by Vic Wood years and years ago. What this does is works in conjunction with the timber, and it actually doesn't leave swirly swirlies all over it like a power sander does because it's working with the rotation of the tip. <coughs> it's working with the rotation of the timber, whereas the power sander is quite often working against the rotation of the, like against the speed of the timber. Now, it's used much the same way. Open at the top. But you're using this back edge here to get the speed up. And again, you don't push it that hard, but you're crushing this edge here like that. You're just letting it go over the top of the, the work. You work backwards and forwards. Same with the power sanding. If you want to reverse it, you come in on the other side. If the chuck wasn't in the way, that would be easier. So I'd go through all the grits like that up to about three or 400, and then it's ready for any finish. Now, for those of you that use Yorkshire grit, triple E, or any of the abrasive paste, <coughs> now, the difference is, Yorkshire grit is a mineral um, based abrasive paste. Triple E is a chemical. It has um, chemicals in it, and that's the difference between them. Now, the application is a little bit different too. Yorkshire grit, you've got to use sanding sealer to get the best out of it and it's done at about 240. I do agree with the fact that after 240, you're creating a lot of dust. <coughs> and the Yorkshire grit does cut down on that. <coughs> Excuse me a minute. It's speaking of dust. <coughs> right. Triple E, you sand to 400 minimum and you put the triple E on at high speed. After you put the put it on with the lathe stationary, and then you use high speed to remove the uh, the abrasive <coughs> Yorkshire grit. You've got to start slowly, and then work your way up through it to to get the higher speed. That's the main difference. Triple E requires a lot of pressure but it will take it to a slightly higher shine. So, and that's all I'm saying about it. But abrasive paste has been around since time immemorial. How do you, the hell do you think the Egyptians polished the stone on their pyramids? They ground up bits of rock in water and polished them. They were slightly harder than the, the base rock. Okay, so that's pretty well any questions on Sandy. Then, of course, you've just got the normal way of sanding, which is like so. Now, as I said, fold it in half, thumb and fingers underneath, so that if it does happen to fall off, it just flies out the back. And if you've got a dust extractor, it gets rid of it real quick. Rattles through the things. Now, the other thing is, too, that if you're coming up when you're doing the inside of the bowl, and this hasn't been actually cut, but I'll turn the camera around onto it. So Darren You've got has to be a question a... in yep. there in regards to the to the abrasive pace. Uh, there yep. was a conversation over these products like Yorkshire Grit and Triple E staining the wood slightly. So what's your read on that? Sorry. 
there was a conversation on one of the on one of the lives about the products like Yorkshire Grit and Triple E staining the wood or discolouring the wood. I have Two never seen, days. I've never seen Triple E or um, Yorkshire Grit, and yes, I have used Yorkshire Grit um, staining staining timber because it's an abrasive uh, and it should be coming off when you when you're polishing it off. I would say if on an open grain timber they haven't been getting it all out. That would be my take on that, I would say. And uh, Mike dances with, uh, I think it's Mike, dances with our ducks. Um, yep. He just wondered if the um, rotary sanders rotate the opposite way in Australia. Yeah, they do. <laughs> We do everything backwards, didn't you know that, Mike? Right. Now, when you're sanding the inside of a bowl, we've got the tim the paper folded like this, with this part here, the solid part. If you try sanding with this loose bit up here, quite often it'll fold under and or catch on something. Always have that part up, the, the part that's folded, and you you actually lift it off the, the work so that you're working. I can't. I'll see if I can get a better photo of it. Yep. And like while you're changing over, Lawrence had a question about what recommended speed on the lathe for sanding. Ah, uh, probably about 500 or so. Like um, in production work, we sand at the same speed as what we turn at. But our sandpaper is only on there for less than a minute in most cases, so that it doesn't get a chance to get hot. But if you feel it's getting hot, slow the load down a little bit and stop sanding. The worst thing you can do is fit a pad in over the top of this, and then, because it stops you from feeling what the paper's doing. So as I was saying, what you do is you curl it over. You keep this edge up off the work, sanding down like that, so that it can't get caught. Because if the paper creases in underneath, quite often it'll rip it out of your hands. But worse still, it leaves a big mark in the timber itself and you've got to start again. So, right. Now I'm going to just bring Rob up again. I've done enough talk talking for a moment. Jeez, three quarters of an hour I've been yakking. Right, Rob. Oh yeah, there he is. Now, yeah. right. Adam's commented. Uh, Neil's commented. Yeah, if you don't take it all off, it'll discolour the timber. Um, Adam's commented. I think like any product, there is darkening, but if it's worked in and removed, generally he hasn't noticed a difference. Yeah, and uh, I, Pete, I see. I see Pete's thing. Oh, yeah, you're dead right, Pete. There is no absolute clear finish. Water is, a, water is the clearest finish you can get, but even it will darken timber. So, particularly, uh, yeah, I have noticed some, and Adam, uh, how everyone's folded woods, I've noticed some kind of dirtiness if you don't clean out the grain afterwards, and that's, that's the problem. Yeah, now I'll just get onto that. I'll just get uh, Rob up on solo so as he can start sanding up his bowls. Right now, Rob, you got the you got centre stage, my friend. And as I said to you earlier, you did a fantastic job on that. That's a ripper. So, if anybody wants to have a look, Rob did a short live just before this one um, to hollow hollow the bowl out and used his normal bowl gouge and then he used a traditional grind with a 60 degree I guess Robo was it and there's some yeah fan no seven, seven, coming off. yeah 60 degrees or 30 degrees depending on which way you look at it how, how you measure it yeah some ripping shaving now, coming off it was a nice job yeah now that's the other thing with sandpaper too Rob's doing the right thing there 
by rotating the paper around. You've got to keep it moving. You don't have to do it in circles, but you've got to keep it moving on the surface of the timber to take scratches out from underneath. Otherwise, it's like a train. It just goes back into the same grooves and makes them deeper and deeper. Oh, I'm enjoying my cup of tea here now while Rob does that. That's good. G'day, Robert Dolman, stuck in. G'day, Robert, how are you? Yeah, this is a fairly easy one tonight, pretty laid back. Rob's doing all the work now. Yeah, I love it. Now, over the years, there's been various methods of sanding. There's been dry sanding like Rob's doing there now. And then there's been wet sanding as well, where you're actually, when you get up towards the last few grits, you get oil or whatever is going on it, coat it in oil and keep the, uh, keep the sandpaper absolutely saturated in the oil so that it forms a bit of a slurry. And it fills any little hollows and things like that, so that you get a very good... Geez, that's a pretty fancy sort of brush, Rob. <laughs> it's supposed to be for dishwashing, but I oh, use it just right. to clean the dust out. <laughs> it's got nice soft um, bristles. Yeah. Oh, that's a good use for it. What grid are you using there, Rob? Sorry, Rob, I didn't hear. Yeah, what grid are you using? Oh, I went up to 320. Right. Um, I think I'm going to drop back down. <laughs> um, That's it's a nice piece of wood, that. Yeah, um, spotted beach. 
Yeah. That, that don't that's where it might think you. <laughs> I'll just mute it so me. Now there's some that say that you should dust down between each grit of sandpaper. I use a lot of soft timbers. Their, their reasoning is that some grit remains on the, on the surface when you go to use the, the next grit. I myself have never come across it, and I use a lot of soft timbers like pine and Oregon and stuff like that. So I never bother cleaning out between coats. When Rob's got this sanded off, looks like he's got the same sort of paper as I have, actually Hermes. So it is available in England, folks. There you go. Question, please, Rebel. I've got um. It's a strange question. I don't know if I should go to San and Sea and Yorkshire Grit now, or I've got some slight lines. Yeah, right. They they actually right. All right. I'll take you off full screen for a minute, Rob, and watch the next bit. All right. Okay. Right here. Okay, now that basically on this, it's sanded up to 400 or 320, 400, is what I would call upper end craft end, craft market thing. Um, now, to take it up to the next level, which is gallery, um, sorry, uh, a really upper end craft market or nearly gallery style. You can wipe it with metho, but I find that metho evaporates too quick in a lot of cases. Uh, I know that Jimmy Clues love putting metho on and then setting them on fire. I've done the same thing around here. <coughs> However, if you do that, please make sure you've got no shavings or sawdust around the place, okay? because it can be a bit hazardous to your health and your workshop. What I prefer to use is a cloth with water on it. Now, it's been wrung out, but it's still... I'll just change cameras again, why don't After your last comment, Robbo, is Neil still in? I'm not sure. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> right. Now, it's been wrung out, but there's still a little bit of water in it, okay? So what I do is wipe it all over, plus it gives you a good idea as to what it's going to look like as far as grain and that goes. The only problem is that it takes a few minutes to dry. Now what that does is raise the grain, it gives you a chance to see whether there's any imperfections in it as well by taking it outside and putting it in the sunlight. If there's any scratches or anything in it, 
the bad news is that you've got to go back and start again. It also washes out any sawdust or anything that's on the on the surface of the bowl. Then the next thing I do when that dries is I go up to the grit that I was using when I finished, which is generally 400, and sand it again. Now, if you have reverse on your lathes, unfortunately this one doesn't have reverse, I quite often sand it backwards. So I rotate, I make sure it goes backwards and sand off that last one. And if you've got any swirly type grain or something that doesn't seem to be cleaning up properly, <coughs> a reverse on your lathe is a huge advantage because you can do alter alternate gr grits like you do 180, say 120 coming this way, 180 back that way, 240 back this way, various ways like that, and generally you'll get any marks out. Believe it or not, all my big lathes have reverse on them because it's far easier to sand in reverse on the lathe, on the bigger lathes with the bigger posts, because you can come in over the top. I don't change cameras again. So while you're doing that, Darren's mentioned an old car detailer's trick is to take a plastic bag like a Ziploc bag over your hand when feeling for scratches. Yeah, that's the other thing too. I never trust my eyes. Always look away from the work and just use my fingers to feel any imperfections in the surface. Because you, your fingers see better than your eyes in most cases. Now, <clears throat> when you're sanding in reverse, you can stand here and sand. And it's much easier than trying to sand underneath here like this. So you can sit your angle grinder or whatever on the top of the work or your hand on top of the work and it still flick away from you. And the, the dust is generally going straight down the hole of the extractor too when it's going in reverse. But fear not, if you don't have reverse, it's not a not the end of the world end of the world. Because what you can do actually is you can put the sand the last coat if you like when you turn it around to take the tenon off. And then it is going in reverse, so you can do it then. All right, Rob, on with the motley. There you go again. Uh, Steve Fleming's asked if you could use a tack cloth to get rid of dust in the grain. Yes, you can. Some people do use tap, tack cloth. <laughs> I myself don't use sanding seal or, uh, at all in most cases because the first coat of lacquer that I put on acts like a sanding sealer straight away and I cut that back. Now I cut the subsequent coat, coats back as well until I'm starting to put the finished coats on and then I don't cut it back at all. For those of you that don't know me, all my finishes come out of a gun. If it doesn't get, if it doesn't come out of a gun, it don't get done. Now, those marks disappearing, are they, Rob? You're on mute at the moment. Can I be turned and say yes? Right. <laughs> Just because um, they're, they're, they're really fine, and I've got a suspicion they're going to disappear when I put this on. And they have, they disappeared. Um, yeah. It's a, it's a judgment call sometimes when yes. you're using sandpaper. Whether you go to the next grid or you concentrate more on the grit that you've got because quite yeah. often the next the next lot of sandpaper will take the marks out. Yes. Wow, that has just popped out with that. Oh, yeah. yeah this is a sand and sealer. Um, 
so the I'm assuming um you say I can't really say the lines anymore, but really yeah. I'm assuming the Yorkshire Grit will get rid of All right, rid well of Yorkshire Grit. Right, okay. And I'm not gonna sing the song. <laughs> no. <laughs> I'm not either. So, so the audience should be very, very relieved at that. <laughs> <coughs> Just warming up. <coughs> Shut up, Sid. <laughs> yeah, I know you've got a mute button, Robbo. Yeah, that's what I was about to say. I, I must admit I tend to forget that I have, except <laughs> to mute myself occasionally. I should explain, um, I had sand at the outside already. Yeah, that's all right. But, uh, but I hadn't, um, I had put sand seal on, but I hadn't put Yorkshire grit on it. No worries. Just going to mute me, Mike. Shirley just come in and said good day, Robo and uh, Robo Cop. She said that is beautiful. Yeah. Good day, Shirley. Sorry, I don't have any curly whirlies for you. Robo said he's got no curly whirlies for you. Well, she, I don't think she didn't mean to offend Robo, but she said your curly whirlies are no good. Yeah, that would be right. He doesn't know how true that is. <laughs> so I'm just doing a rough one on the inside of this bowl. Amy and Darren have said hello. Good day, Amy. Darren. Now, the next step after this basically is for exhibition work where you're getting judged and all that sort of thing. Uh, it's like litter boxes. Litter boxes, if they're going into a competition, should pop. But for all practicality, they should be a nice fit so you can just lift them off with one hand. It's only wood turners that insist on uh, popping lids. And the only way to do that is by just working up through the grits until you get to whatever you desire. Like, as I said, that friend of mine, Ken, he goes right up through to the finest paper you can get, which is nearly flower paper. And as he will spend hours and hours and hours just sanding it. And he examines everything with a, with a uh, magnifying glass. So Darren and just commented. He said uh, he thought Robe was Robe Rob was using Yorkshire grit extra coarse with the noise in the background being your chisel. No, it was my chisel there. Um, and uh, when I was judging the Australian national wood turning thingos, I used to carry an eight power magnifying glass with me to examine the finish. And at one stage, it came down to very, two very, very, very good turners in Australia. And I had to get the magnifying glass out because they're on equal points and I had to separate them somehow. And on the underside of one of the little handles that the turner is renowned for, there was a minute scratch. 
And when I told him about it after the competition, he uh, he said, where? And I said, here, come and have a look. So I got out my magnifying glass. He said, bucker. He said, I missed that. So when you're in the national competitions or something, be aware that they will go over it with a fine tooth comb. Yeah, that's looking pretty smick, Rob. Righty-ho. Now, I'll just take you off full screen again. Put me up on full screen again. All right, is there any questions so far? No, I've been reading them out pretty much as they go, so... Yeah, right. Now, that at 400 will accept oils and everything like that. You can put your oil coats on. I don't use much Danish oil for finishing, except as an undercoat, which most of you know has got to be dry for at least three days before you can put an overcoat on the top of it if you're using it as a primer or an undercoat. The reason for that is that it takes that long to gas off all the, the uh, additives in it. So where am I up to? Yeah. Now, oils, in my opinion, are a high maintenance finish. The old rule used to be with Danish oil, and I'm talking about proper Danish oil like Rustin's or Watco, is that it was a coat a day for a week, and then a coat a week for a month, and another coat every month thereafter for 12 months, and then you had to do it every 12 months to keep to maintain the shine on it. As I said, all mine come out of a gun. I use nitrocellulose lacquers for most of my... Um, craft fair work when I was doing craft markets and things I would use a 95% gloss they shone so much they used to reflect light for a very good reason that shiny cells and that's the only reason for my normal type of work I only use a 30% gloss I use a product called Wattle Stylewood you can actually get it in 30%, 50%, I think, 60% and 95%. You can't get a full 100 gloss. But trust me, the one, the 95% knocks your sock off if it's put on properly. Now, normally, I apply any finishes. If they're oils or anything, I use a cloth. I don't use paper towel. Because a cloth absorbs more than what a papal towel does, so you can get a good wash coat on it. And Danish oil or stains on that, you really have to flood them on in, in, in a lot of cases to, to coat properly. And with Danish oil in particular, you've got to keep oiling up the dry spots until it, main, until it doesn't absorb any more. And on spalted timber, that can be a, just about a day-long exercise because it just keeps sucking it up like a big sponge. So um, I think that's about it on, on stains and things like that, unless anybody's got any questions. No, but Fat Axe mentioned earlier he found some uh, chisels that Keith's been um, answering some questions on. Thomas Turton, I think it was. Uh, yeah, I think Keith bought some um, Glenn Lucas chisels, didn't he? Was it Keith or somebody else that bought? No, I no, it was David, David McLennan. Bought some Glenn Lucas tools. Radio, change cameras again for a minute. If you find a finish that you like, 
I tend to stick. I tend to suggest that people stick with it because that you learn how to do it properly. I know what I was going to do just to keep Mr. Oosby Us happy. Oh, wait on. Got to plug it in first. I got, got stuff all over my life. Amy's leaving, Robbo. Sorry. I said Amy's leaving. All right, Amy, thanks for coming hey, in. Amy. Ah, you mongrel! Suck the jiggle up! That's not a bad effort. Oh man, it's amazing oh, well. this thing. There's no need to be so pedantic with the shavings, is there? <laughs> no, well that's right. It did a suck it sucked the gouge right up those. <laughs> I must admit, that's a magnificent vacuum cleaner, that thing. It's, um, it's Darren's <laughs> asked if you've ever used the glazer turning chisels. chisels. Glaser or glazer. Yes, I have. Many, many years ago. Um, they went out of production quite a while ago. I haven't heard of them for a few years now because the... Uh, I think it was Alan Glaser that, uh, I think that was his first night, had it. But um, another fella took it over, but I haven't heard from him since. So. Okay, so Ben's in and Ninja Man's in. Right. So it must be a Nova Chuck. It is. goes backwards, which I've got to remember occasionally. Okay, now we're going to finish off the bottom of the bowl. There is a heap of ways of finishing off the bottoms, like to get rid of this tenon here. Okay, now even if I use a mortise, I always remove the mortise. Um, it's just a, a thing in Australia that most wood turners always make the bottoms look as good as what the top is. So... Now, you could use your chuck, like I could have left the chuck on, put padding over the top and put the, the thing on like that. But I found even with padding sometimes that the sharpness on the edges of the jaws here quite often leave a mark if it slips particularly. So I don't do that. Now, one way of doing it, And I find that this is actually the quickest way of doing it, or one of the quickest ways of doing it. Flat piece of three-quarter inch plywood. With a faceplate ring on the back. Now it's been faced off, and it's got a... I'll just switch cameras again. And it's got, um, uh, I think it's PTFE, Neil will correct me, um, foam on it. Now, you've got to be careful of some foams. It, uh, this isn't the right foam for this. It's what I had lying around the place um, to use. Because if it frets itself against there, you actually leave the stain of the foam on the rim. So now this only applies to flat rimmed bowls. In other words, flat across the top like that. 
So uh, Keith just said that Glacier or Glacier tools are still in production. Oh, yeah. Yeah, just so I haven't seen them around for a long time, Keith. I'd, they were excellent tools, actually. They were the first of the really um, high-speed, high, like M2s and steel like that. And Chris Dodd reckons you should try and sell that vacuum cleaner to Brian. Yeah, that might suck his concrete he can, up. At, he can stand at one end of the shop and just vacuum it all straight up. Right, now all, all it is is that little hole that you put in the middle here. Wait on, I'm on the wrong camera again. When I was forming the tannin here, I put a, a little hole in there with the centre in this case. So as I can relocate it again onto a flat plate like this. Now you can buy cold jaws or jumbo jaws or whatever you like. <laughs> I've never had much success with them unless I modify them like this, which I did a video on very early in the piece. Was done as a live. I put plywood facings on like that. The bowl fits down into there. These are undercut like a big dovetail and it'll clamp a rim in nice and tight and centre it every time. Right. Now, if you've got a thin bottom on them, be very careful about how much pressure you put on it. Normally, when I'm doing this, I would actually use a cone centre, a pure cone centre, but it's in the tool room, so I'm not going to worry about getting it. That's the only time I use a cone centre. The rest of the time, I always use a revolving cup centre. Now, tool rest, where do I put it? Ah, there it is. Ah, oh, things are getting a bit stiff. Now, always cut towards the headstock because that's the strongest part of the lathe. Particularly if you're using cold jaws or anything like that and you try cutting across, quite often it'll just flip it out of the little, the little uh, rubber stopper thing, which can be a right pain because it's amazing how far it actually goes. Now, you can use a bowl gouge for doing this or you can use a spindle gouge. I'll just do one or two cuts on it. Make sure the uh, spindle lock is off. Now, the advantage of this... Asked a question, Robbo. The, yep. The, I think he's referring to the video about modifying the cold jaws. Is it called modifying cold jaws? I think so, yes. Yep. Now, you can use a bowl gouge on it if you like. Like so. Or you can use a spindle gouge. That was the one that got sucked up the vacuum cleaner. Where's it gone to? Down there. Right, that's as far as I'm going to go with that at the moment. The one I particularly don't like is the donut chuck. Because I've used the donut chuck for quite a while that a friend of mine had. And to be quite honest, I could never get the thing tight enough to hold a bowl properly. And that's sad to say because it was invented by an Australian and only that was a member of a club that's only about 150 kilometres away from there. So I'll just put the link for modifying cold jaws in the chat. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's all right. Now, if you're doing production type work, what I quite often do is use the bowl that I'm going to do after the bowl that I've done. And while it's still a blank in there, 
I just turn it down until I can do this with it. I'm just going to round over the corners on this one. So you've got your bowl blank in here. That'll do. Right. Now you can use the, the non-slip type matting if you like. I actually prefer to put a cloth over it. And pat it. So I just get a cloth, fold it into about four, put it over the top, like so, and get a rubber band put on the top of it. Or you can use a jam chuck just to hold it nice and level. And again, using the little dimple you put in, the thing now, if you've got so Darren's natural asking lead, what timber is that, which one? Uh, jacaranda. Now, if you've got natural edge bowls or like winged bowls or something like that, this is a great way to hold them. You just bring it straight up because the inside of it is still shaped right to fit around there, whereas you can't hold a winged bowl or anything against the flat plate. Now, you can go to the expense, if you like, of getting vacuum chucks and various other things as well. Right. Ah, swing this around there. Right. And again, using a bowl gouge, you can clean this right up here like that. Now, the advantage of a jam chuck, and I'm talking about a proper jam chuck, where this rim would be put into a, a slot or something like that and locked in tight, it's also the advantage of the cold jaws and, and the modified cold jaws you can decorate this base here if you want to after you've done it because there's nothing in the way. Like at the moment, this tail, the tail stock is in the way. So you can only go down a certain amount. And you make sure that this is undercut. Now, if I put a big tenon on something, like, as I said, I normally run 90 mil or 120 mil tenons on a lot of my stuff I do. I decorate the edge of the tenon, I flatten it out across there, and you can either round over the base like this on the edge of the tenon, or my favourite one is I actually like to put a little bit of a curve in there just to show that it's got a foot. So, right here, Rob, have you got anything like that to be able to do that? Um, I, I don't, but I, I, I've got a little piece of um, pine, of course, what we used for the leg. Oh, yeah. So I could pull up a tree and centre, put a tenon on it, and round it over. Yeah, look, um, don't don't worry about it. I think you've right. you've probably seen the method a million times anyway. Yeah. So that'll be okay. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is about it. I'll just get the chat up so as I can see it. Thank you, Robo. Thank you very much. No learned, worries. Learned a lot. I've got to, I've got to say, Rob, that Robocop, that that bowl's a stunner with that grain and the pattern in that wood there. I love it. I just waxed it because I panicked when Rubble started turning the tenon off. <laughs> and I, oh, no, I'm going to have to turn it around and turn the tenon off. So I waxed it. <laughs> and, uh, so it turned out I might have had time. <laughs> no, it's come up very nice. It's now, that's the good. thing. Actually, Rob brought up a good point about um, waxing. 
depending on the wax you use, we have a stuff out there called uh, Shi Ho, which is spelled S H I T H O T, um, but pronounced Shi Ho, wax stick. And for a lot of simple things, it's great, <laughs> but it's got, to, it's got to be put on as uh, friction. So you've got to get it spinning reasonably quick and you apply the wax stick to it. Now, a lot of the paste waxes, that, particularly that the English use, oh, that's come up really good. Yeah, that looks excellent. That's a rip. Um, Terry from Occasionally Turning with Terry just said, very good, Robbo, and he loves the bowl, Rob. Yeah. And, Thank you. Um, with waxes, what it pays to do is give them a light coat, very slow speed to make sure that you even out the coat a little bit, then go and have a cup of tea. Everything around there is timed by cigarette or cup of tea. One or the other. Cup of tea takes half an hour. Cigarette takes 10 minutes. So let it set and then come back and polish it. And then you can put extra coats on if you need to. But if you just put the wax straight on, it's like the old film saying, you know, wax on, wax off. It just You lift 90% of it back off again instead of letting it get into the grain. Any more questions? No. Um, Darren's commented that a foot is often a nice visual break that draws the eye. Sorry, what was that? D Darren has commented that a, a foot is often a nice visual break that draws the eye. Yes, it does. Like, oh, well, I think most people on here know that I like feet on things like vases and things like that because it makes you look at the the body of the whole thing. It lifts it up. It elevates it up off the ground a bit. Uh, I have a question, please, Robbo. Yes, go ahead. Do you know on on the live I did before this, and I used the the scraper. Yep. I had it flat on the tool rest and in horizontal. Yep. And you were you were just explaining before how you're best off tipping this at forty five yeah, well, degrees. Quite often on the inside of a bowl, yes, you can't get it up on the 45. It takes a little bit of practice, but you can uh, do it, believe it or not. Yes. <laughs> but that, that the way you were using it is the correct way to use, well, the normal way of using a scraper. Right, okay. But you've got to have a, a touch like your mother-in-law's kiss. Yes. And it should be just bringing off uh, little fairy down shavings, you know? Yes. Yes, that's great. Thank you. Because a scraper should be a finishing tool. and uh, Unless you're hogging out with a bowl, you're hogging out a bowl. There's quite a lot of American turners that use scrapers for hogging out the material in a bowl as well. One yes. that comes to mind is uh, Robo Hippie. Yes, I've seen them. And um, then, of course, there's others that use carbide. <laughs> C word. <laughs> All right. I'll be on for another Sorry. three or four minutes. I'll just, I'm just going to have a quiet cigarette while uh, people are chatting there. If you've got any questions, think of them now. Up, yeah, I've got it up. Yep. A few good comments. Just thanks coming in. And uh, if you've got any anything that you would like to see, please just message me and I'll endeavour to, to do it. Hmm. Maybe. And that does not include pens. <laughs> I'm hoping people do have suggestions because I, I want some more free lessons. 
<laughs> no, I really appreciate it, Rebel. You've you've put us on the on the correct ladder. You've put us on the first few rungs. I've still got a mountain to learn. But all the information's there. I just need to learn it and cement it in my in my head. Yeah. Well, you're actually not a bad learner, Rob. You've, I've I've seen the difference in the way that you've done doing things. So you must have been practicing at some time. Yes, I, I try to. Um, from the first lessons you give, I try to practice. Uh, well, as much as I can, but nothing compared to a production which turn who does eight hours a day or nine, ten hours a day. Um, but I've, uh, I've tried to practice basically because I've had to, um, because some of the things is not natural to me. In moving my body is one I have to concentrate on because I tend to move my. Uh, I tend to stand away from the lace. Yeah. I've got a little. Um, I'm gonna peel it off. <laughs> I've got a little sticker on you. Oh man, it's it's ripped. <laughs> Never mind. It says, "Stand closer and twist gouge." Now, yeah. there's probably a million things that I do wrong, but no, these well, uh, these two is what I'm working on at the moment. As as I said to you tonight in your live, yes, your entry cut. And yes. the cut was perfect. Like you started with the flute absolutely shut until yes. you got bevel support and yes. then opened the flute out to 45 degrees or 2 o'clock. Yes. And you notice the difference in the cut. Yes, so this, definitely. Yeah. If you have a look at the camera now, you can see how close I stand to the light. Yes. Yes. Yeah, I'm, I'm definitely trying to, to get closer than to... Um, in the twist gouge, by the way, that was because on, um, do you know the, oh, sorry, I just got to grab a piece. Um, I'm going to drop things, pick up a gouge. <coughs> um, of course, there's a lot of nuts in there. When we're doing these curves, we, I wasn't uh, twisting this enough. Wait on. Just let me put you up on full screen for a minute. All right, not me, you fool. I was going to say, wrong one, Robbo. Yeah. We want the good-looking fella, not me. <laughs> yeah. Right, so, um, and the curve, my tendency was... Instead of coming round here, then twisting and ending up straight. You did it I wasn't, the other way. I, well, it wasn't so much that. It was just I wasn't rotating this. Yeah, so I was right. coming round, but I wasn't I wasn't rotating this. So I needed to practice. And I had to put that on the sticker. To <laughs> sound stupid, but I need the little reminder, <laughs> basically. And um, and when I do most of these, sand close, I twist, gouge, I no doubt will be putting other things on. Yeah, I'd and ninja, ninja, ninja man, you can make your own jigs if you really, really want to, and um, all you need is a grinder. But I, in my game, I just find it too expensive. For the uh, for the carbide cutters, because I wear them out so quick. Oh, I did practice a ball actually. I didn't finish it. It was one which I had, had half done ages oh, yeah. ago, but I had put a recess in it. Yep. So before I did this, I watched your other lesson. And um, I practiced hollowing this, but I've got a little torch. I um, I nearly got a funnel. I'm going to use my torch to shine through <laughs> there. I don't know if you can see. Oh, you can't. Can uh, I light? I turn no, that light smooth. off. No, so it's not going through, but it's really thin now. It's so close yeah. to going through the bottom. 
Actually, that's that's part of the reason too why I like a tenon because you can actually see where the bottom of the bowl actually is. Yes. A tenon rather than a recess. Yes, I must admit, my tendency was to do a recess to save turning, um, finishing the bottom, which is the wrong attitude. So from now on, I will be using tenons more often. But the purpose was, I was thinking, when, when that's there, I do the outside, I put a recess in, finish finish it, then yeah. turn that round. And when I finished this bit, then the whole thing's finished. Yeah. As, as opposed to doing the third step. So that's that's the main reason, actually, that most people use a, a mortise in them. But yeah. I'd like to, even with the mortise in, I still like to put a, like, take the, the mortise out, if you like, and leave yes. the leave the ring around it where the foot is but yes just, so as people don't know how you held it that's that's the only reason i do it yes well i think i'll be doing that doing that from now on <laughs> thanks barry All right, ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to knock it on the head. I'm not sure when I'll be doing the next one, but uh, always schedule them anyway, so it comes up in, if you subscribe to me, you'll find me. And I'm not. All right, thank you for attending. I hope it's been an interesting night for you, and I hope yeah, I've answered you, everything. Everyone. Thanks, Thank Chris. you. Thank you, everyone. Thank, thank you, Robo J. And Sam. Good job, bro. Uh, thank you for having us. Yeah. Who? There's nobody on tonight, I don't think, is there? Um, uh, yeah, Wayne's, on, Wayne's on tonight, UK time at. Stace Mix is on at the same time. Um, Stace Mix is on too, yeah. She's on at. Eight o'clock UK time tonight, which is probably about four o'clock in the morning for us. Yeah, and I know Steve's on. Steve's on tomorrow lunchtime. Yep. The Steve lunchtime and Nikki show. Tomorrow. Yeah. Steve's announcing the uh, challenge. And Martin Sabin, is that what his name is? Oh uh, yeah, that's right. Martin yeah, Sabin Martin. Smith. No, he's wait, on no, right now. Oh, no. Now. Right now. Oh, that you was pretty much started last. when you did. Oh, righto. All right. Yep. So Wayne's on a, in about Wayne's on in about eight hours, and then Steve's on tomorrow lunchtime. Yeah. All right. I thought my, I thought Steve was on Friday nights, not bloody Saturday nights. That's why no, I Steve's always Saturday on, nights for him. Steve's on Friday and Sunday. Yeah. So there's a Friday that's lunchtime live, which is a Friday night for us. Yeah, that's the, right. The, yeah. All right. Because there was nobody on Saturdays. That's why I chose it. All right. Anyway, I'm going. Well, the, the, Good the night all. For the lunchtime lives, I don't think. Anyway, yep. Take it easy. Bye, everyone.